This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to Africa News Tonight from the English to Africa service of The Voice of America, your source for Pan-African news and world developments. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Coming up on Africa News Tonight. This is a commitment for $150 million into Zambia's mining sector. And I think this is a model for what we need to do more of. It's a big deal. Gina Raimondo, U.S. Secretary of Commerce, on one of the biggest deals made at last week's U.S.-Africa Summit. Details coming up also. South Africa has deployed troops to protect some of its biggest power stations. Germany hands over 20 Benin bronzes from its museums to Nigeria. And Tanzania signs a contract with a Chinese company to complete a rail line. We we'll have these stories and more on African News tonight. We start with our top story, the Loss and Damage Fund, agreed to last month at the COP27 Climate Conference, aims for rich nations to help those that have borne the brunt of the global warming emissions. In Niger, climate change has fueled desertification and conflict as communities compete for dwindling resources. Henry Wilkins visits a community that is demonstrating how more funding can make a difference and speaks to the country's environment minister. It's often said those least responsible for climate change will suffer the most because of it. This is especially true in Niger. According to non-profits such as Concern International, Niger, along with its neighbours in Africa's Sahel region, is likely to see a 3 to 6 degrees Celsius increase in temperatures by the end of the century, with devastating impacts for one of the poorest and most difficult to farm regions on Earth. Yet in 2021, Niger produced just 0.007% of global emissions. The change in climate is also adding to a rise in militant groups linked to Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, according to the United Nations. Jean-Noël Gentil is the UN's World Food Programme Niger Country Director. Climate change is, is uh, contributing to the, to the deterioration of natural resources, with population competing then for the safe natural resources that are shri shrinking. So there is a direct relation between climate change and uh, security. To help countries like Niger, a loss and damage fund was agreed upon at the UN's recent COP27 climate conference in Egypt. In theory, richer countries and bigger emitters of greenhouse gases will pay to assist the countries suffering from climate change the most. Nonprofits say the cost of the damage caused by climate change could hit $1.8 trillion by 2050. Niger's environment minister, Garama Saratu Rabio Inusa, told VOA the fund needs to become operational quickly. She says there's an urgency to make the funds operational. Not only making the funds operational, she says, but also the urgency to make the funds available through an easy funding mechanism that favours countries such as Niger. Hawa Koba Maigaradi lives in a village in Niger's border region with Nigeria, an area that could benefit from the fund. A project run by the World Food Programme has reorganised the village's farming practices allowing them to farm during the dry season in addition to the rainy season. She says food production has increased and the older and younger generations of the village no longer have to go elsewhere to find work, since they can grow crops twice in a year. It's an improvement because there is now not only enough food to survive, but also enough to sell, she adds. In a neighbouring village where there is no assistance, a farmer says they do not have enough to eat. Environmentalists say that details such as how the fund will work and how money will make it to villages like those in Zinder need to be nailed down. Steve Trent is with the Environmental Justice Foundation, a UK-based environmental non-profit. The political pitfalls are, are developing states just decide not to pay. And, and it, it's hard when you want to get governments to, to write that check. It's difficult to get them to do it particularly in the economic climate that we face globally now. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change declined to give an interview on how the fund might work and how long it may take to become active. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Zinder, Niger. 
Tanzania signed a two billion dollar contract today with a Chinese company to compete to complete a rail line connecting the country to its neighbors. The French news agency AFP says the 2,500 kilometer line will link the Indian Ocean port of Dar es Salaam to Mwanza on Lake Victoria, with eventual ties to Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda. President Samia Sulu Hassan says Tanzania's total investment could reach over $10 billion. She dismissed criticism that the project has entailed too much foreign debt, saying the country lacks resources for improving its infrastructure. She says the new railway would cut transportation time from 30 days by truck to 30 hours by train in 2027 and it would reduce the costs of shipment to the DRC from $6,000 per ton to about $4,000. Libya's Tripoli-based government of national unity under Prime Minister Abdul Hamid Dabiba is protesting Egypt's decision last week to draw its maritime border with Libya, while Turkey is reportedly urging both countries to negotiate an agreement. Egypt's unilateral decision could affect ownership of numerous offshore gas fields amid a rivalry between regional powers Egypt and Greece on one side and Libya and Turkey on the other. Edward Diranian reports for VOA from Cairo. Vast undersea natural gas resources and the right to drill in waters off the coast of Egypt and Libya are prompting recriminations between regional governments after economic interests led Egypt to unilaterally delineate its maritime border with Libya last week. A decision by Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi to draw his country's maritime border with Libya drew protests from the foreign ministry of Libya's Tripoli-based government of national unity over the weekend, in addition to protests from the prime minister of Libya's rival government backed by the country's parliament. The unity government's ally, Turkey, reportedly called on both countries Sunday to negotiate a maritime border agreement to resolve the conflict. Egyptian political sociologist Saeed Sadiq tells VOA that it is not clear if Egypt made the right decision by drawing its border, but he says important economic interests are at play and Cairo can't afford to wait for Libya to become a stable country again. I think for the time being, each country has to look for its own vested interests, taking into consideration that Libya has been very divided since the fall of Gaddafi, and it doesn't seem that there is agreement when is the election, when there will be stability. Egypt cannot afford not exploiting its own natural resources until the others resolve their own situation. Presidential elections in Libya, originally scheduled for December 2021, were postponed indefinitely, leaving the country in political limbo with two governments supported by rival Libyan and international parties. Qatar Abu Diab, who teaches political science at the University of Paris, tells VOA that the vast undersea gas resources in the East Mediterranean have put Egypt at loggerheads with both the Tripoli-based Libyan government and Turkey, which supports it. He says that Egypt has been very prudent over the years not to provoke Turkey, despite its ongoing political conflict with Ankara, over Turkey's support for the Muslim Brotherhood group, while the Libyan government of Abdul Hamid Dabeba in Tripoli, which Turkey backs, is exploiting the maritime issue as a choke point against Egypt, which does not recognize his government. Abu Diab argues that it is probable that negotiations between Egypt and Turkey will intensify in the coming year, given that both countries have major interests in Libya, both strategic and economic. Paul Sullivan, a Washington-based political and energy analyst at the Atlantic Council, stresses that given the significant natural gas reserves in the East Mediterranean, All the regional countries involved are making claims, so it is likely that tensions are going to build until some sort of general agreement is made. Edward Uranian for VOA News, Cairo. A 
worker with the French medical group Doctors Without Borders, or MSF, has been kidnapped in northern Mali. Police sources told the French news agency AFP that an African individual, possibly with the group's logistics office, was abducted yesterday in the region's largest town, Gao. MSF had no comment. AFP notes that a kidnapping in the country can have many causes, from the decade-long Islamic insurgency to crime, with some victims released after a ransom is paid. Fighting between rebels and the militaries of Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso has killed thousands of civilians, troops and police and led more than two million people to flee their homes. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. I'm Iheyes Wuhib in Washington. Please note, we have moved our programs from voanews.com to voaafrica.com. There you'll find all your favorite VOA radio and TV programs and a whole lot more. Find us on voaafrica.com. Nearly. Fifty new commitments between U.S. and African businesses were announced during last week's U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit in fields ranging from mining to healthcare to basketball. More on some of the specific deals from VOA correspondent Mariama Diallo. Gina Raimondo, U.S. Secretary of Commerce, talked to reporters about one of the biggest deals made at the summit, an investment by U.S.-based Cobalt Metals. This is a commitment for $150 million into Zambia's mining sector. And I think this is a model for what we need to do more of. It's a big deal. Why Zambia? Cobalt Metals president and founder Josh Goldman says that when the company looked around the world for the best places to invest, Zambia rose to the top. Zambia is a safe and peaceful place where we can hire exceptional people, where the laws support investing for the long term, where we can operate in ways that protect the environment and support local communities, and where the government supports our investment with actions that are fair and transparent and fast. Goldman says his company will be working with the global mining investment firm EMR Capital and Zambia's public-private mining company ZCCMIH. Zambian President Hakainde Hichilema was at the signing and said this new partnership goes beyond his country. This investment is in copper, cobalt around there, which are critical minerals to gravitating us from carbon-driven fuels to green fuels, electric vehicles. It's what we're talking about. This is not about Zambia. This investment today is not about cobalt, it's not about ZCCM, it's not about Zambia. It's about all of this and the rest of the world as we grapple with climate change issues, as we grapple with replacing climate-damaging fuels to bring fuels and therefore electric vehicles. Very, very important to us. Cobalt is an ingredient in lithium-ion batteries used in electric vehicles, tablets, laptops, and smartphones. Another signing occurred between two financial institutions, USXM Bank and the African Export-Import Bank known as AfriXM Bank. The latter's president and chairman, Benedict O.K. Orama, told VOA that by signing a memorandum of understanding, the two institutions moved from intention to action. It is a memorandum of understanding for collaboration to support trade and investment between Africa and the U.S. with special focus on diaspora engagement. We have an envelope of $500 million attached to that memorandum of understanding. Uh, also, we use this funding to support the critical sectors that Africa needs, the healthcare sector, the uh, climate adaptation projects, um, aspects of transportation infrastructure, and power uh, as need be. The National Basketball Association was also at the summit to announce its ventures into Africa. The league's Africa CEO, Victor Williams, told VOA he was excited to be part of the forum because sports is an area where Africa has world-class talent. 
He said that while Africa NBA is happy to grow the game basketball on the continent, there is more. We're also uh, really interested in the opportunity for sport to be a driver of economic growth and development, as well as for sport to be a vehicle for social impact. The league already has offices in South Africa and Senegal and plans to expand in other regions. Earlier this year, we opened an office in Lagos, Nigeria. And uh, we just announced that in 2023, we'll be opening an office in Cairo, Egypt. This speaks to our commitment to grow our footprint on the continent and to use those offices as springboards to get closer to African fans. He said each of those countries represents significant basketball and commercial opportunity. Maria Magello, VOA News, Washington. Germany has handed over 20 Benin bronzes from its museums to Nigeria. The move is part of an agreement between the two countries to release all the 1,130 relief sculptures in German's public galleries. Reuters notes that some of the artifacts have been held for nearly 200 years in private collections. British soldiers seized over 5,000 of them and other sculptures from the Kingdom of Benin in 1897. Many were auctioned off to institutions in Germany, the United States and London, which has the largest collection. Nigeria is urging the British Museum to return more than 900 bronzes in its possession. In South Africa, President Cyril Ramaphosa has deployed the military to protect some of the country's biggest power stations. Police have also arrested a number of people for allegedly sabotaging equipment essential to generate electricity. South Africa has been enduring blackouts lasting up to 12 hours a day for the past six months as state electricity company ESCOM lurches from crisis to crisis. Darren Taylor reports. Sources in the South African National Defense Force have told VOA that military engineers and intelligence officers are among the army personnel now holding a strong presence at power stations. The move is one which was expected by the security industry and probably welcomed. Andy Grutko is a former ESCOM security chief, now an independent security consultant. He says there have been several mysterious fires and equipment malfunctions at some of the parastatal's coal-driven plants recently. There are people who are suggesting that, in fact, there are some political machinations behind this where the problems which ESCOM were experiencing were not just criminal, but they were politically inspired to pressurise Andre Dureta to uh, leave the organisation. It's a little bit of a Machiavellian situation right now. Andre de Reiter is the CEO Ramaphosa appointed three years ago to save ESCOM and the country's electricity grid from impending ruin. But de Reiter resigned last week after senior members of the governing African National Congress, the ANC, accused him of mismanaging the power crisis. Throughout his tenure, de Reiter complained of being undermined by corruption, organized crime and sabotage at ESCOM. Claims that were always credible, says Grutko. Well, certainly sabotage is a concern and it is ongoing. The few cases that have been revealed so far have been commercially inspired. One in particular that was revealed was a maintenance person who was removing certain uh, pressure plugs to ensure that there would be breakdowns and that would make sure that his company continued to receive maintenance contracts. He's confessed to that and uh, is being prosecuted for it. On the surface, he says, crimes such as this would be for internal security in collaboration with police to deal with, which begs the question why Ramaphosa sent soldiers to ESCOM power plants. Are these military going to be deployed inside and sort of looking over the shoulders of maintenance people or are they going to be inspecting the loads of coal that arrive to make sure there aren't rocks in the coal this does seem to be a little bit bizarre we're not facing a military threat some security analysts are saying maybe the president's intelligence services have given him information to indicate that south africa's energy infrastructure is indeed in danger from external forces Ramaphosa sent soldiers to protect power plants in July 2021 when riots, allegedly instigated by supporters of former President Jacob Zuma, swept several cities. 
The ANC's leadership conference, currently underway in Johannesburg, is rife with rumor that the escalating electricity breakdowns are designed to undermine Ramaphosa. The president's supporters allege the sabotage is orchestrated by Zuma, an allegation he dismisses as stupid. Corporate security specialist Calvin Rafadi says there are obviously all sorts of funny things happening in and around ESCOM, but deploying soldiers isn't the solution to any of them. In this space, we're not sure what are they bringing. The military, they say they're bringing 10 guards to each and every power station to look after the power station. The situation at ESCOM, they've diagnosed it so wrongfully. It's far more complex than what they think. Rafadi says ESCOM's become a political battleground that's also infiltrated by organized crime syndicates stealing diesel, coal and equipment. These issues are for the police and politicians to solve, he says, not the army. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. Tunisian police have arrested Ali Laraye, who served as prime minister from 2013 to 2014. The government of President Kais Saeed accuses him and others in the Islamist influent Inhada party of allowing as many as 6,000 Tunisians to volunteer to fight in Libya, Iraq and Syria. Tunisian opposition parties say the arrest of Laraye is an effort by the government to detract attention from the vote for a new and constitutionally weakened parliament over the weekend in which only about 11% of voters cast ballots. The powerful Tunisian General Labour Union says the boycott shows the frustration and despair of Tunisians amid rising prices, inflation and food shortages. It also shows their rejection of Saeed's constitutional reforms, which granted him more powers while weakening the role of the legislature. The French news agency AFP says Islamic Sharia police in northern Nigeria have arrested 19 young people for organizing a gay wedding. A police spokesman in Kano says four men and 15 women, including the female organizer of the event, were arrested Sunday at an event center where the ceremony was taking place. All were remanded in custody pending further investigation. Authorities are looking for the would-be couple who escaped. In 2014, Nigeria passed legislation outlawing gay marriages and civil unions. Anyone confirmed to be in a same-sex union can be jailed for up to 14 years. AFP says same-sex relations are also punishable by death, though the sentence has never been enforced. An appeals court in Finland has ordered suspected Liberian warlord Jibril Masakwa to go on trial just months after his acquittal. The French news agency AFP says Masakwa, who was moved to Finland in 2008, is accused of atrocities including rape, ritual murder and recruitment of child soldiers during Liberia's second civil war, which ended in 2003. Masakwa was a former senior commander of a Sierra Leone rebel group that fought in Liberia, the Revolutionary United Front. A Finnish district court acquitted him in April, saying the prosecution had not proven with sufficient certainty that he had committed the alleged crimes. The new trial will open on January 10th in the Finnish town of Turku, about 170 kilometers west of Helsinki. It will move to Liberia in February to hear witnesses and to Sierra Leone in May before returning to Finland by June 5th. And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yeheyes Wuhib in Washington. For all the latest developments on the continent 24-7, visit our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of our producer, Mokbilia Barrow, and our engineer, Cornelius Tanner, thanks for choosing the Voice of America.